Hello everyone, President Sunday here. This will be the first part of a section-by-section, -section, God help me, breakdown of Steven Pinker's 2011 book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. I've decided to make this an ongoing series because, while this book isn't really all that dense, it's so unfocused that addressing the thing as a whole, even just an entire chapter as a whole, with any sort of care is basically impossible. It's definitely more work than I want to spend on it. If you're not interested in slogging through this godforsaken brick with me, and I can understand why you wouldn't be, believe me, here are two brief notes on the text before we go into chapter one. First of all, while the book isn't mentally challenging by any stretch, it is physically exhausting. Despite nearly clocking in at 750 pages, and that's including its endnotes, the level of detail and specificity Pinker provides here is far beneath that of your average Wikipedia article, which means there's no sense of discovery or insight to motivate you to keep on reading, which is a problem because everything else aside, his writing is really dull. The most immediate way in which this lack of detail manifests is in Pinker's utter failure to provide any clear definition of violence going in, and since his thesis is that quote-unquote violence has declined, this absence of any sort of definitional constraint lets him judge more or less any time period's degree and intensity of violence according to the needs of his argument. In short, this book is almost 800 pages of nothing. And second, since Pinker lacks any training in historical or philosophical research, his sources are typically obvious and inappropriate. He has no acquaintance with any serious literature on either Greek history, biblical history, biblical exegesis, Roman history, political theory, etc., all the things that he's going to be talking about ad nauseum. The upshot of this is that when Pinker addresses ancient history or ancient texts, he uses only those resources which would be obvious to a complete layman prior to conducting any sort of research. The problem is that just listing off a litany of icky things mentioned in the Iliad and the Bible doesn't establish anything concrete about the world as a whole at the period which these texts depict, or in which they were written. So, all this to say, while as a policy, I never tell people not to read anything, be forewarned if you choose to read this that Pinker will waste your time if you're reading him strictly for what he claims to be selling. Anyways, with that out of the way, let's begin. So the first chapter, which I'll be covering in this video, is broken into eight sections, and God bless him for doing something right, Pinker breaks them all down in the table of contents. They are Human Prehistory, Homeric Greece, the Hebrew Bible, the Roman Empire and Early Christendom, Medieval Knights, Early Modern Europe, Honor in Europe and the Early United States, and the 20th Century. In the first section on human prehistory, Pinker mentions five archaeological finds of mummified bodies that showed signs of violent struggle. I say they showed signs of violent struggle rather than having suffered violent death, because it doesn't even appear that all of them died through violence. Kennewick Man, for example, was found to have a stone projectile in his pelvis, but the bone had healed over it, indicating that he lived. And that's basically what this section consists of. Here's a list of less than 10 mummies. Some appeared to have died violently, some only experienced violence. Great. Pinker concludes this section, which is barely more than two pages long, with the brilliant observation that, quote, prehistoric remains convey the distinct impression that the past is a place where a person had a high chance of coming to bodily harm, unquote. Just ponder that for a second. On the sole evidence of these dead bodies, prehistoric people had a high chance of coming to bodily harm. Amazing. And then we move on. That was literally it. Tens of thousands of years of civilization. Iceman got shot with an arrow. That's what we get. So we come to the next section on Homeric Greece. Now there's a major problem just in the title of this section alone, and that is that there was no such thing as Homeric Greece. I've talked about this in my Troy video, but to recap, as the Greek historian Thucydides noted, 
The common name of the Hellenes, what we would later call the Greeks, wasn't adopted until after the poems of Homer were committed to writing, which is why Homer refers to Argives and Achaeans, but not Greeks. Had Pinker actually read these texts, this would be apparent to him. But as to the actual content, referring to the Homeric poems, Pinker says that, quote, Though these narratives are set at the time of the Trojan War around 1200 BCE, they were written down much later, between 800 and 650 BCE, and are thought to reflect life among the tribes and chiefdoms of the Eastern Mediterranean in that era, unquote. Pinker is being especially slimy here. Why do I say that? Well, consider that the sole source Pinker uses for this section on quote-unquote Homeric Greece, and really he just means Greece because his next time jump is to Christian Rome, is a book called The Rape of Troy by Jonathan Gotchell. Pinker has no idea on the basis of this book alone that among people who study this material, Homer's poems are taken to reflect life between 800 and 600 BCE generally. First, 150 years is a really long span of time if we're talking about social norms or how communities are organized. In the span of just 100 years, Athens went from an oligarchy to a tyranny to an oligarchy to inventing democracy. The idea that the poems of Homer represent how life was in all of quote-unquote Greece over the course of 150 years, let alone 50, is beyond parody if you know anything about Greek history or even Homer for that matter. Pinker doesn't know anything about Greek history, and he knows the sources he provides are insufficient. So what does he do? Does he step back and do some actual research before writing the book? No. In what we'll see as a running theme, Pinker's solution is to simply invent an academic consensus that says his sources are sufficient. Put simply, to cover for the fact that he's too lazy to do actual research, Pinker outright lies to his readers, with the result that those who take him at his word believe that they understand something about a critical period in human history, when in fact they've learned nothing. So Pinker then claims, quote, the wars in archaic Greece were as total as anything in the modern age, unquote. And as evidence, he cites Agamemnon telling his brother Menelaus, quote, Menelaus, my soft-hearted brother, why are you so concerned for these men? Did the Trojans treat you as handsomely when they stayed in your palace? No, we are not going to leave a single one of them alive, down to the babies in their mother's wombs. Not even they must live. The whole people must be wiped out of existence, and none be left to think of them and shed a tear." Unquote. Two things here. First, the definition of total war is not that non-combatants are killed. Non-combatants have always been killed in war. Total war is when civilian resources are purposed towards a war effort such that the totality of a state's resources are invested in a conflict. Now this has the effect that civilian targets are now important to winning the war effort, but a war isn't simply total because one side wants to kill the women and children of the enemy after the fighting is over, because at that point there is no more war, and the non-combatants in question aren't contributing to a total state investment in fighting a war, because at that point, where the women and children are being targeted, the war is over. Second, and this is actually kind of obvious when you think about it, the fact that Agamemnon feels compelled to convince Menelaus to show no mercy to the Trojans indicates that it wasn't necessarily always the norm for them to do so. Yes, whole cities were wiped out all the time in the ancient world. It was indeed a very dangerous place. This doesn't mean that doing so was either expedient or treated as acceptable in all cases. At any rate, the Iliad is a bad study for this because, as well as being historically dubious and of unknown authorship, it only covers a tiny portion of the Siege of Troy and doesn't tell us anything about the relations between tribes generally. But Pinker doesn't stop. He goes on to equivocate between the brutality of ancient and modern weaponry. Quote, We also commonly read that 20th century wars were unprecedentedly destructive because they were fought with machine guns, artillery, bombers, and other long-distance weaponry, freeing soldiers from natural inhibitions against face-to-face -face combat and allowing them to kill large numbers of faceless enemies without mercy. 
According to this reasoning, handheld weapons are not nearly as lethal as our high-tech methods of battle, but Homer vividly described the large-scale damage that warriors of his day could inflict." Unquote. He then shows a quote, not from Homer, who was equally gory to be sure, but from Gottschall, describing how nasty getting hacked and stabbed to death by Bronze Age weaponry was, and he's right to point out that combat in the ancient world could be absolutely brutal, but as grievous as it could be, it wasn't large scale. One man did not kill twenty within a span of seconds over a hundred yards. Furthermore, not only do modern machine guns and bombs do all of the same damage as Bronze Age weaponry, but it does them at a faster rate, and their ability to strike at range means that at any given time, every soldier could be fatally attacked. Although they certainly suffered serious psychological traumas, you don't read in the literature about ancient warriors becoming disturbed, paranoid recluses like you read about Vietnam veterans. These are simply not the same kinds of thing. Airplanes, mines, and snipers mean that whole units can be wiped out even while on the march or in camp, before combat even begins. For an ancient Argive warrior, actual combat is a rare occurrence. The Siege of Troy lasted ten years, and for most of those ten years, life went on as usual, even for the combatants. People could leave the walls of Troy and gather resources or perform rituals without snipers picking them off from a mile away as they exited the gates. Soldiers could feel pretty safe even in the thick of combat as long as they weren't in the front rank. For the unlucky guy who got a spear in the face, that's a really rough deal, but there's no comparison between that and a bomb leveling a neighborhood in an instant because the local factory was essential to the enemy war effort. Pinker's whole argument here is that primitive weapons are ickier than modern ones, but they really aren't. Our weapons today blow softball-sized chunks off of bodies instantaneously. They set people on fire. They make them go instantly blind and deaf. The atom bomb literally melted people's skin off. And they do this to everyone at once, civilian or not, and this goes on for the entire duration of the conflict and even then after because mines don't just disappear once the war ends. And this to say nothing of the fact that these weapons generally destroy the environment as well, so rebuilding is often impossible. Now Pinker concludes this section with a discussion of rape in warfare, suggesting that for Homeric heroes it was perfectly acceptable, and he's correct, uh, to commit rape in the process of taking enemy territory. Um, but he immediately switches tracks and refers to the kidnappings of Helen and Briseis as if these were examples. The problem is that Helen went to Troy willingly. It's one of the few things even film adaptations of the Iliad get right. Briseis, on the other hand, was explicitly not raped. After Agamemnon has Briseis taken away from Achilles, and she was resistant to being taken away, he swears on pain of divine retribution that he didn't lay a hand on her. Furthermore, her relationship with Achilles is as consensual as anyone's could be in the ancient world, i.e. it wasn't consensual really at all, but it also wasn't the kind of thing that we read about Isis or the LRA doing either. Briseis actually has a speaking role in the Iliad in which she mourns for Achilles' companion Patroclus after he's killed by Hector. Now since, in an earlier sense of the word, rape referred to kidnapping, not sexual assault specifically, and Pinker does go into this later, there's a loophole in which these examples do make some sense. But since he doesn't provide that clarification here, it's obvious that he's banking on a modern understanding of the term for purposes of exaggeration, which is simply slimy. Inexplicably, Pinker switches to talking about Odysseus having his wife's suitors and his own concubines killed after returning home as if this was a relevant to the unconcluded discussion of rape in war, and b. not definitionally an unusual occurrence because it was performed by a hero under exceptional circumstances. And then, after just listing these, his concluding line comes out of nowhere with a random polemic against Greek religion. And he says, quote, Rather than framing the scourge of warfare as a human problem for humans to solve, they, the Greeks, concocted a fantasy of hot-headed gods and attributed their own tragedies to the gods' jealousies and follies, unquote. Here's the thing. Warfare wasn't a scourge for all ancient Greeks. Many did it intentionally because it made them rich, gave them prestige, and was fun. 
Even philosophers who had seen how destructive war could be thought it was essential to human excellence. You can't have warrior virtues in Aristotle if there's no capacity for war. Furthermore, regard for the gods served important roles in regulating social mores and stabilizing society. Even disbelievers in the gods saw their worship, or at least the worship of a surrogate, as crucial to the health of the polis. And thus concludes Pinker on Homeric Greece. That's it. <laughs> so, yeah, we then move on to the Hebrew Bible. Why, I'm not entirely clear. Um, but I'm not going to go into a point-by-point -point breakdown like in the last section because it would be tedious. The basic point of this chapter is that the Old Testament of the Bible is filled with descriptions of death and destruction and ickiness, and the obvious point is that things were just as bad for them as they were for the Greeks. That's not interesting. What's interesting about this chapter, as well as the one following it, is that the Bible is Pinker's only source. At one point, he laughably suggests that, quote, modern biblical scholars have established that the Bible is a wiki. No, they haven't, Steve. Wikis are asynchronously edited by large groups of largely self-selected people, and they're updated on an ongoing basis and are subject to critical revisions and such. The Bible isn't a wiki. To return to the point, the theme of this chapter, as in the last one, is that Pinker hasn't done the necessary research to justify writing a single paper on the topic, and so he's going to stretch what little he does know and pretend that it's sufficient. The reason why this chapter is so long by comparison is because Pinker has actually some acquaintance with the Bible, albeit almost certainly through anti-theist blog articles, you know the kind with titles like Old Testament Murder Count. The idea that Pinker has actually made himself up to date on modern biblical scholarship is simply laughable, because despite having more pages, this section has even less content than the last one on Homeric Greece, if you can believe it. It's nothing more than a list of icky things. And then Pinker moves on to Christian Rome. And what's his sole source for that? The New Testament. There's not much to say here either, other than the fact that after he exhausts his incredibly limited uh, reading of the New Testament, he moves on to the Colosseum and certain styles of execution as examples of the greater violence of the Romans. It's such a blatant case of confirmation bias you almost ignore it. Um, at one point, Pinker writes about Roman crucifixion, and he says of that, quote, Though I like to think that nothing human is foreign to me, I find it impossible to put myself in the minds of the ancients who devised this orgy of sadism, unquote. And this basically sums up this whole section. Pinker hasn't done the requisite readings, and so what he's describing is effectively an alien planet to him. And the discussion goes on from here to discuss torture generally, and he mixes it up with metaphors and literature that employ violent imagery, and it's just a big swamp of random descriptions of unpleasantness completely denuded of all context or significance. And I'm sorry if it seems like I'm getting lazy here, but there's just really nothing worth getting into. Because he has studiously avoided defining any of his terms from the get-go, this section is just a panorama of things that Pinker finds scary. It's all meaningless, and it's so, so boring. There is one slightly funny moment where he seems unable to grasp a basic metaphor, concerning Matthew 10, 34-37, where Christ claims that, quote, I bring not peace but a sword, unquote. Pinker says that it's not clear what he planned to do with that sword, but there's no evidence that he smote anyone with the edge of it. As if this was an active possibility. Now, normally I'd give him the benefit of the doubt and just say this is just a badly written sentence, but, I mean, look at what we've seen thus far. And now we just go nuts. Pinker moves on to a section on medieval knights. The upshot of this section is that knights weren't those noble, gentle paragons of chivalry like you see in cartoons. But again, nobody serious contends that they were. Knights were warriors. Their job was fighting. If you look at the Middle Ages solely through the activity of knights, it's going to look as violent as the activity of knights was. As with the previous sections, Pinker's sole source here is a single text, specifically a 13th century romance called Lancelot, 
which I have to confess I hadn't heard of before reading this. But as any introduction to such a text would likely have more useful information in it than Pinker provides here, I suggest that as with the Bible, it is unlikely that Pinker has even read this for himself. And there's three more sections, but I really don't think we need to get into it because it's just more of the same and you get it by now. So early modern Europe following medieval knights, um, he talks about the Inquisition torturing people and the Tudors chopping people's heads off. Like there's no argument here, it's just, again, a list of bad things. It's not persuasive, it's a waste of everyone's time. Why? Well, to conclude, I'm going to get into that a little bit. As far as I can gather from reading this, the production of this book must have gone something like this. First of all, Pinker is not a man who likes to read, and contrary to this image of himself he's tried to cultivate as sort of your quintessential public intellectual, he has no natural curiosity about anything. But he really does like to look smart. So instead of doing the necessary research, he just tried to stretch what little he already knew into something that sort of looked like an historical overview, in the hopes that the sheer number of pages would mask the fact that he doesn't know anything. His only acquaintance with Greece was some references to Homer he'd seen on the internet, so he researched online for something on violence in the Iliad. His only acquaintance with Rome and Christianity was through anti-theist blogs and maybe people like Stephen Fry, so he tried to pretend like a list of mean things people did in the Bible was sufficient to give an account of what life was like for both the Hebrews and the Romans. And after that, I can just see him panicking to himself. Shoot, what's next after the Romans? Uh... Uh, I know, the Spanish Inquisition, they did mean things, what else? Oh, um, shoot, uh, oh, knights, yes, I saw Excalibur, knights were violent. I bet there was an old book on it somewhere, let's just check the old Google and, haha, okay. And what, what next? Damn it, I can't, oh, yes, kings of England, they cut people's heads off, haha, <laughs> you get it. Right down to the reason he gives for why this book exists, Pinker demonstrates that he has zero conversance with any of the literature he pretends to have. At the very beginning, he insinuates that it is a common misconception that the present is more violent than the past. But nobody says this. All of our media depictions of the past are defined by their violence and brutality. People refer to ISIS as medieval when they cut people's heads off. Or think about this. This book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, was released in 2011, the same year that the first season of Game of Thrones aired. What people do say is that something like the global toll of modern violence is greater than it was in the past, specifically through the environmental and social harms caused by single systematic causes like industry where nobody is held accountable, or with modern weapons which don't just ruin bodies in grotesque ways but make the earth itself uninhabitable. And these are serious arguments. Arguments which Pinker is shutting down dishonestly, for the sole purpose of scratching out a niche for himself to sell books from. When the reality is, he has nothing to offer anybody. Your average Wikipedia editor outclasses him. So I've been hammering this point to death, but there's really not a whole lot else to talk about in this chapter, so I'll just sum up to conclude. Pinker's entire modus operandi is to invent a consensus that doesn't exist, and then to pretend that his book is taking part in a dialogue with that consensus. And people buy into the scam with the effect that readers are very bored and Pinker is very rich. We'll see that he even does this in psychology with a blank slate, wherein he characterizes behaviorism as advocating the stance that the mind is a tabula rasa, which it doesn't. At any rate, someday Pinker will die and I will have my revenge for having to have slogged through the swamp of despair that is this abysmal excuse for something it aspires to be which clearly isn't scholarship. God help me, there are nine more chapters. Take care.